Welcome to Matters of Decorum. I'm Scott Corum. This is what matters to me. Call of Cthulhu stories. I said I would talk about a character of mine named Hugh. I will tell the first of the Hugh stories tonight. Um, I've been trying to figure out what to call this drink. Uh, I started off by thinking of it as the HP Latte, but I think I'll go with the more appropriate name, the Death Kraken Latte. It is Death Wish Coffee, a shot of Kraken Dark Rum, and some French Vanilla Creamer. Because a storyteller needs to keep their whistle wet, and Hugh's quite a story. In general, I like to make me up my own characters. I like to roll my own characters. I like to come up with them from from concept to conception to completion. Um, I have a very few set types of characters that I like to play. I should branch out a little bit more. Every so often I do. But this time, it wasn't a character that I made. Hugh was handed to me, a character who had been played a little bit by another player uh, and uh, one of the pre-gens, my friend Mike Shields, was running Call of Cthulhu. And Mike, the owner of the, the house we play at in Manhattan Beach, has put some pre-generated characters in front of me that have changed my life. That's how we did the entire Tomb of Horrors. Another story sometime. Hugh and his compatriots were veterans of World War I. They'd been trench fighters together. They'd seen some things, gotten involved in terrors on the battlefield. And they'd faced the horrors of war in those horrific trenches in Europe fighting across Germany and Germany and France, and uh, then they'd encountered Lovecraftian terrors and somehow were still alive. Had a, a bond of, of friendship, camaraderie. Great group of guys, and we're, since we had this relationship at that particular game where we really trust one another as players and we, we, we rely on the, the game masters there to, uh, test us. It was a really, really good set of chemistry there. Good character chemistry, good player chemistry. Mike runs a hell of a game. And this opening, this... I think this is a prepackaged adventure, but you would never have known it. Because Mike doesn't stick with the package. He, he plays the package for all it's worth and pulls things out of it that you would not expect to be there. He ran my own game for a while, stuff that I had written, and I didn't recognize stuff from it until I until he told me it at the end. So yeah, yeah this, is, this is going to be something special. Hugh was the team's heavy gunner. Uh, machine gunner, big, buff, strong, not smart. Not even a little bit smart. Barely literate. Which was a change because I didn't like... I, I don't generally like playing characters that don't have a fair degree of intelligence, but Hugh had personality. He was not a pretty person. He was uglier than he was dumb. Which isn't the kind of character that I generally like to play, but okay, this is something different. Didn't know how long we are going to be playing. But because of how the stats lined up in Call of Cthulhu, you know, the Chaosium system, Hugh wasn't smart. But he was wily. He was clever. He had a... a native intelligence, a uh, animal instinct. And he wasn't pretty. But he was affable. He was likable. He was, uh... 
he was an okay guy. He was your buddy Hugh, and yeah, that appealed very greatly. So we had a few misadventures running around staying alive while stuff was blowing up and cults were all around us and we were just trying not to die it wasn't easy chaosium's call of cthulhu system is unforgiving if you mess up in that system i've had i've had characters die five minutes out of character creation i've had characters I saw an entire group of adventurers wiped out by one guy on a flight of stairs with a wheelchair. Just that and physics and game mechanics took everyone out. So, these characters are tougher and they're experienced and they've got combat skills which count for something. Not a lot of characters in Call of Cthulhu do. It's, uh, it's a different kind of experience. It's not your, your, uh, chaotic stupid murder hobo group you don't have that in call of cthulhu well you can but they don't last no you've got to be smart clever wily stealthy and when it comes time to actually engage in something resembling violence which might not even happen during your campaign you have to be first to shoot and last man standing all of these things described our group. There was infighting. My buddy Finn was playing the pretty guy in the group, and he constantly was on top of of a uh, of, few, of insulting him for his looks. And you know that was you know party dynamic. Had the whole kind of A team thing going, the uh, BA Baracus and face and. Howlin' Mad. Howlin' Mad was Sarge. That was our that was our leader. My friend Ross was playing Sarge and so well. Cause we'd have taken a bullet for each other, but we'd also we'd be the first one to take a bullet for another dude, but we'd also be the first one to put a fist in their face so they needed it, you know. Just cause. we had a, a night where a bunch of us were sleeping in a second floor hotel room one of the guys I thought it'd be funny to just get a couple of really bad cigars and smoke the room out while we were asleep and he woke up and, well World War One trench fighter his first assumption upon waking up unable to breathe coughing and wheezing and he can't see is that it was gas and so he screamed gas and jumped out the window not smart Survival instincts, but not smart. Caught the guy who was who had done it laughing because you made huge jump out the window. A second story building got cut up and hurt pretty bad, but I made it. Threw a hammer at him because he was laughing at me. Didn't quite break the arm that I hit, but it was close, and you got the idea. That's the kind of group it was. We'd been through a lot, and Hugh's character had developed and gotten this accent. He was, he was the mook. He he was the the East Coaster, kind of should have been busting people's knees, but you know he got he got sent off the war, and that that happens. But he was with you. you know, he was a solid guy. He was the Palooka. And then there was the amusement park. By the time we got to the amusement park, we'd been through a lot. We'd seen some monsters. We'd fought some monsters. <sighs> Thing about Shoggoths. If you see one, you're probably going to die. Because you can hurt them with metal. But they've got a whole bunch of points, and it doesn't matter how big the thing you hit them with is. You're doing a point of damage. You hit him with a hammer, you do a point of damage. You hit him with an axe, you do a point of damage. You hit him with a car, that's made out of metal, you do a point of damage. He was the machine gunner. He just hit it with a lot of pieces of metal in rapid succession, and that... I didn't kill it, 
I'm not even sure I heard it, but it didn't like that, so it left. We called it a victory, but we all kind of figured I'd given it an ouchie, and if it had thought about it for a second, it just would have eaten me. His characters had been amazingly lucky, and the dice rolls had gone our direction, and it was going to it was going to end up badly, but we had to deal with a cult in an amusement park, and there were monsters, and this thing was a number of sessions. Amusement park, 1930s, 20s, late 20s, getting on towards the 30s, and... In preparation for dealing with this situation, because we knew there were going to be a lot of monsters and a lot of things that were trying to hurt us, and we were not going to have an easy time of it, we hit a hardware store. And guys were buying machetes and whatnot. Uh, at that time, it wasn't hard to get a shotgun or a good rifle at a hardware store. Hugh bought all their hammers. All their hammers put them in, uh, double bagged them in burlap. Actually, one burlap sack, one canvas sack for strength. So, Hugh was armed with a sack of hammers. Because people had told him that that was how smart he was. So he figured, if I'm going to be as smart as a sack of hammers, I might as well carry one. And it, it sounded funny, and everyone's kind of chuckling. And then the Game Master sits back, and Mike's like, how much damage is that going to do? What's Hugh's strength? Hugh was strong. And we sat down, ran some numbers, and looked at the system, and a sack of hammers does a lot of damage. Uh, when you've got someone who can actually pick up and swing a sack of hammers, if they connect, they're going to do... Some damage, doesn't matter what kind of thing you are from the outside of reality, a sack of hammers is going to mess your day up hardy hard. It was then I realized that the weapons as they were listed in the book were not going to be what we were going to kill monsters with, because... Yeah, you can do damage with a hammer, but you could also do damage with a sack of hammers, and... Yeah. Hugh picked up a double proficiency in sack of hammers, because that was... That, that defined the character, the sack of hammers. Because there was a compound across the street from the amusement park, we had to go underground tunnels, and the tunnels were full of things. They might have been ghouls, I'm not sure. I never got a, that, that. That was the great thing about the game, is that, you know, you didn't get a page number from the monster manual for what you were shooting, killing. Mike could describe it to us, but tunnels, lantern light, we, we couldn't see clearly. They weren't entirely clear of themselves. They didn't exist entirely in the same reality as us. So we got bits and pieces and snippets and strobes of the lanterns falling and spinning as we fought, and I'm not sure what they were. They were sure of mauling us pretty bad. Then I got my first hit in with a sack of hammers, and there was a crunch and a squish, and if I didn't kill it, I made it hate its life so bad it left. That's another thing. In your classic role-playing game, Dungeons & Dragons, what have you, monsters fight no matter how many hit points they've got, and that can happen in Call of Cthulhu too, and that's not just monsters and, and standard role-playing games, it's how people tend to run them. You know, you run your character at something until you're out of hit points, so the monsters come at you until you're out of hit points, it's just how it works, but Mike took things into consideration. That hurt. Getting hit with a sack of hammers hurt. It was intimidating. It, even for monsters, it was like, that guy hit me with a sack full of hammers. I can't use the left side of my body anymore. I probably shouldn't be in this fight. It, it saved us. We get to the amusement park. We come across the merry-go-round. And the cultists have let the animals out of the zoo portion of the amusement park and these were not this is not a petting zoo we didn't have to face goats and sheep no no 
I have fought stuff in Call of Cthulhu over my career as a gamer from from fungi from Yuggoth to Night Gaunts and Biaki. But man, three Pumas messed us up. That was one of the most dangerous fights we've ever had. Um because they were sharp and they were cloy and they had really high percentages to hit because they were fighting on this dangerous natural instinct and they weren't enhanced they weren't corrupted by the outside there wasn't anything they were just defending their territory and killing the hell out of us we uh, almost died a couple of times and pumas are very nimble and very capable of getting out of the way of a sack of hammers because a sack of hammers, as hard as it hits, is not being swung that fast. And as stealthy as we were trying to be, shotguns got deployed. And I'm sure, I wish we had grenades. And we were in close quarters combat. You know, a grenade at least would have spared us the dying by puma. That was so close. And then one of the one of the guys, I forgot the character's name. Brian was playing. Rolled under the, the the merry-go-round to try and get away from him. And one of the cobras from the zoo was under there and was just getting ready to. Now he yelled. And uh, I realized the only thing that was going to save us was just a little more chaos. Just a little more chaos. I am a big proponent that no matter how bad a situation is, there isn't a little benefit in making it worse. At the very least, it's funnier. If you can make a bad situation worse for everyone involved, not just the player characters, if you can make a situation environmentally worse or increase the sheer amount of chaos, there's opportunity there. A little Sun Tzu. So, I jumped on the merry-go-round and yanked the on lever so hard I snapped it off. Merry-go-round starts going really fast. So Brian's character is on the ground looking up at this cobra coming at him and the cobra rears up and the supports from the merry-go-round start duk, 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 across the back of the cobra's head and knocked it out. Of course Brian had to contend with the fact that if he moved too much, the merry-go-round would kill him. He was now in a meat grinder if he did so much as anything but a sniper crawl on his knees and elbows. Um, which he managed. Got the cobra. But now we could maneuver the pumas next to the merry-go-round and they had to contend with this thing moving very fast and making a lot of noise that the stealthful approach was done at this point in time. And we we were able to use the chaos to our advantage. The cultists did not all come out. They were hiding. Preparing. But at this point we get a map of the place. You know, we, we've, we've dealt with the pumas, we've dealt with the cobra, we're past the animals, we start searching the place, and Mike gives us a map. And it's like, here's, here's the, the, the houses, and here's the house where the guy that you're after is, and down here's the rest of the amusement park, and here's the roller coaster, and here's the Ferris wheel, and here's the, uh, the, the here, here's the edge, edge, and the pier, and the ocean. Yeah, your, your, your back is to the ocean, you've got road on the other side, uh, here's the big top. We were in trouble because uh, it was big and it was full of stuff and we had our fight in an amusement park and it was not going to go our way. So a bunch of the guys, well, me and Sarge, I think, we're looking through, we find the bomb making supplies that the terrorists had, the, the cultists box of dynamite. And Sarge looks at me, and Ross looks at me, and he's like, Hugh? And Hugh's like, 
bucket and starts loading his Hugh's got a really good throwing skill. He was the, oh, he was the, the heavy weapons guy, so he'd also have the grenades. He'd throw those pretty accurately. So I just started stuffing dynamite into my damn pockets. Big, big World War One trench coat, trench fighter coat. I mean, the, the the wool thing. So I had a lot of pocket space, and I just packed it because this was not this is not a situation that we were actually looking to get out of. If we were lucky, maybe, but. Luck didn't team with us. We were carved up by the Pumas. And the, the fight with the monsters underneath the ground had, had taken a lot out of us. We didn't have a lot left. Realized that the cultists, you know, we find some schedules and a couple of clues, and the cultists are conducting a ritual that is going to bring horrible things to the world in the house up there that the uh, leader was owned. So we're looking for an advantage. We're looking for a position where we might be able to get a shot or, or do something. And as Sergeant and Hugh are crossing the, uh, the amusement park, shot rings out. Sniper catches Hugh in the shoulder. Hugh is down. He's almost completely down. Not totally. He missed all the dynamite, but... Uh, Sarge grabs him, brings him undercover. We look around. Second shot rings out. The guy misses. Thank goodness. And we spot the flash. He is sitting on top of the Ferris wheel. He's in the top cart in the Ferris wheel. He's got a commanding, dominating view of the entire amusement park from there. Sooner or later, he's going to spot the other guys, and then he's going to be able to plink us off at his leisure. And I'm like, nah. Nah, I'm not going out like this. I'm going out. I'm shot. I'm bleeding. I ain't going to make it. But I'm not going out like that. Now look at the map. Like, Mike? Yeah? Am I wrong, or is the Ferris wheel facing the leader's house? And Mike's face goes white for a second. And he looks down and he goes, Yeah, yeah it is. It's right there in a straight line. I'm like, right. Because if I'm going to go out, big. So, I have Sarge get in the, uh, the control room for the Ferris wheel. And I say, when I say go, just crank it. Sniper cannot can can hit any point in the amusement park except right under the Ferris wheel. So that's where I go to the to the the, the, the engine under the Ferris wheel. Got just a little bit of automotive mechanics. I understand motors and engines. I pull the limiters off of it. I, I pulled the limiters and the governors off of the engine. Told Sarge to go. Ferris wheel, wheel starts going, and it starts going a little bit faster than it's designed to, and the guy is, is trying to get his balance, He's and loses his commanding view, he's going to be down amongst us in a moment, but it's going to be a, a process, and uh, heavy rifle, I start shooting away at the uh, supports for the joints on the other side of the Ferris wheel. One shot this side, one shot that side, one shot this side. Between that, the fact that the Ferris wheel is now moving much faster than it was designed to with a screaming sniper trying to hold on for dear life, lest he be thrown out at about 30 miles an hour. Um, sniper gets another couple of shots off. I the, the engine goes. The engine goes first and batters the Ferris wheel and the area around it. I was fortunately behind one of the supports at the time with uh, with diesel fuel, and the Ferris wheel is now on fire. Spinning faster than it's designed to, it starts to shake apart, breaks free of its supports, and rolls true and straight. I killed the cult leader with a flaming Ferris wheel.
no matter what happens from this point in time, Hugh is immortal, because he has killed a cultist with a flaming Ferris wheel. And we all just sat back for a moment, picturing what that had looked like. Because this is like the movie 1941, taken to the dumbest possible extreme, with more property damage, and yeah, we killed Hollywood. We... I'm sure the Ferris wheel didn't stop on the cult leader's house. I mean, there's the other houses, and I'm sure families and people and stuff, but we saved the rest of the world, so you know what? Omelets and eggs, man. Omelets and eggs. So there we are. The amusement park is on fire. I have a coat full of dynamite. I'm bleeding out. And from the hole, from the wreckage of the house, there's a, a bellow, a holler. It's not human. We managed to stop the ritual from being completed. The cultists were dead, but they'd got something. They'd opened up the gateways to the other side of reality and something had come through. the guys who could ran up and started opening up into the hole and it wasn't doing anything so I'm like hell with it pull the coat off I'm going to throw the coat down there the house is on fire there's fire everywhere coat's even starting to smolder at this point in time because we had to run through the, yeah I might as well just throw the coat down there the Chaosium Call of Cthulhu game runs on a percentile system. You roll percentile dice. I didn't have a... I had a really good percentile, like a 45% or so to, to throw. And that uh, that's like baseballs and grenades and whatnot. So there's a little bit of a penalty there. Uh, Mike was really generous. I think it was only taking like a 5% penalty. 40% on, on, on a percentile dice. That's not bad. Um... So I threw the dice. 40 or under. If I hit a 40 or under on percentile dice, I'd be fine. I roll a double aught, a 100. The worst possible roll, a critical fumble if ever there was one. Everyone just stares and looks at him for a second. Mike was super generous because he was a legend. He just killed him. Oh, with a with a flaming Ferris wheel, and we'd all gotten really attached to these characters, and I'm like, you know, it happens. And and Mike was like, okay, you know what? That's that's your roll to throw. Now roll to keep and keep your balance, because it, it's not going down the hole. It's going someplace. But let's see if you can keep your balance. And so I picked up the dice and I dropped them on the table. Double ought two in a row. The dice had declared it. Hugh was not making it out. So, I threw the coat, and I went down the hole with the monster, but, you know, Hugh didn't let go. And whether a coat full of dynamite was enough to send away whatever thing they had managed to get in their last desperate ploy, or whether it just decided that tasted stupid and noble, maybe I don't want to be here right now. We'll never really know. It stopped the thing. It went away. And the rest of the group breathed Hugh for a few minutes because he was everywhere. You don't win Call of Cthulhu. You don't have a, a progression in levels like you do for Dungeons and Dragons or anything else. It's not a you know, how old does your character get? How far do you advance? Are you able to beat things up? Nah. Call of Cthulhu is a race. If your characters are encountering the uh, Lovecraftian horrors that the world is made out of, and if you're playing the game, you are, they're going insane. You have a sanity track. It is a big block on the front of the character sheet. And you see that number going down. 
the whole time you're playing it. <coughs> you have a hit point, a box, and that's the race. Are you going to die, or are you going to go insane and join with the madness that is destroying the universe? It's hard to say which way is worse to go, but you're going out. You're fighting things man was not meant to know, that we can't even perceive not as they truly are. They don't respond to damage or physics the same way people do or anything else in this universe, because they're either so alien to the universe that they don't respond the same way or they're so integral to the universe that the universe can't bear them to be injured. But sometimes a little bit of both. You have no ultimate hope. Your only hope is to make some sort of a difference. And in this hope, in this struggle to make a difference, it's a race. Are you going to die or are you going to go insane? He was one of the saner characters I'd had. He'd faced this stuff, but he dealt with it. He wasn't smart enough to understand a lot of what he was seeing. And he didn't... I mean, he had a pretty high level of toughness and mental resilience. He dealt with it. He was used to facing horrors. And this stuff was more than he could handle, but he was handling it as best as anyone could be expected to. Hugh's race ended when he died. He lost all his hit points, spectacularly, and arguably could be said that Hugh made a difference. That's not a bad way to go out in a Call of Cthulhu game. Blowing up in a coat full of dynamite, landing on top of some monster that was going to eat people and now it's gone for whatever reason after killing a bunch of world-ending cultists with a flaming ferris wheel, that's not a bad exit. Thing of it is, that's only the first Hugh story. There's another one. But that's another time. Thank you for joining me on this little trip down memory lane. I like revisiting old characters, especially the ones that I used correctly. Again, you put a pre-generic character in front of me, I'm going to get everything I can out of it, and you'll know, read everything into the sheet that I can, and uh, while I prefer playing my own characters, a pre-generated character can be a lot of fun, take you out of your, um, out of your zones of comfort, and make you roleplay things that are difficult to roleplay. I like me a challenge from time to time. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to give me a like. If you didn't like it that much, go ahead and give me a thumbs down. Feedback is feedback. I like getting comments. If you have any suggestions for things you'd like me to talk about or have Call of Cthulhu experiences of your own that you'd like to share. I'd love to read some of those. Or any questions. I love fielding questions. Leave me a comment. I love getting comments. You'll love leaving me one. Feel free to subscribe. In fact, I'd like it if you subscribe. If you're not already subscribed, don't forget to hit the little subscribe bell next to the subscribe so you get notifications. Uh, uh, subscriptions is one of those numbers that I check all the time, and the more subscriptions I get, the more reach there is, the more this thing gets to be more like something I can actually do for a living. If you really dug the video and would like to contribute in a more meaningful fashion, uh, feel free to hit my Patreon page at www. Scott, uh, www. I I'm going to wave this, and the address is going to show up here. And I want to do it right because www.patreon.com slash scottcorum. There we go. Have a look around. Consider donating. 
for every donation is extremely helpful and helps me produce videos and continue doing stuff like this and hopefully will allow me to produce better videos the more patreons that I have in the meantime thank you again for watching looking forward to seeing what you folks think about this my name is Scott Quorum this is what has mattered to me, and I'll see you next time on the next Matters of Decorum.